Well, we, this is a joint venture between Reykjavik and the International Society of Tropical Foresters that we heard, hope this is one of many future joint efforts. And we are glad to have you all here today to hear about um, how community, how we can make things work for communities for forest restoration. I'm just going to give you a brief introduction to one of the partners that has put this session together, the International Society of Tropical Foresters. I'm the executive director for the organization. Just a quick overview um, and then some way that we may as an organization be able to support this sort of effort. We are a collaborative information sharing network of members and chapters focused on the conservation and sustainable use of tropical forest resources. Our mission is to facilitate and promote sharing of best practices for the effective management, protection, and equitable and ecological, sustainable use of tropical forests and natural resources around the globe. The organization was founded in the 1950s. It went dormant in 2012, but was revived in 2017. At present, we have 2,000 members in 109 countries with 11 chapters, including Nepal, India, part of the region for Rekhoft, also Nigeria, Ghana, Rwanda, Mexico, Puerto Rico, and Panama. So um, what can ISTF contribute to community-based restoration? First, membership. Uh, communities that can, if, if people in communities are members of the organization, they can link into our network, which includes information resources, expertise from our senior forester resource pool, as well as from other members, opportunities to collaborate with other members and chapters. And we are at the present actively seeking how to help our members connect with financing and avenues for procuring this funding for members' projects. So at present, ISTF membership is free. To join, uh, you can, I don't try to do that membership form. I can send that when I've got people's emails so that we can send this around if you wanna join. And this is our website. That's that part simple, tropicalforesters.org or send an email to tropicalforesters at gmail.com. And I thank you very much. And I hope that you have a great session and I turn it back over to Ron. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sheila. Do we need to close this PowerPoint? Uh, I think on. Sorry. No, just to close it. I'll put it on. Yes, thanks a lot. All right, thanks a lot, uh, Sheila, for this uh, very nice uh, welcome to everyone. Well, as I said, we are we are we're going to spend some time to discuss about the enabling condition, how to get local people involved in the forest landscape restoration. I think, well, you have heard a number of sessions earlier in other other rooms talking about the roles of indigenous people, local people, and how to get them involved. Well, I am from the Regional Community Forest Retraining Center for Asia and Pacific. We have our vision and mandate to promote the uh, local people engagement in sustainable forest management. We work in seven countries, Nepal, uh, Myanmar, uh, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam and Philippines, and also we built a number of state members and also civil society representatives uh, learning how to work with local people. So I think everyone knows that in terms of having effective landscape restoration program, uh, without engaging with local people, it's gonna be difficult because they are there, they have expertise, they have uh, resources to offer. So I think within this se uh, session, we'd like to bring in the practical experiences from our speakers who are sitting here. So uh, let me uh, introduce our speaker here. Uh, so we're gonna learn from uh, Christine. Uh, 
Sambrono, yeah, uh, her experience working on the watershed development because uh, that is the uh, specific areas, uh, Karut watershed model forest. This is practical experience that she can draw uh, why we need the uh, local people involved and how uh, she do that. So she implement the project on forest landscape restoration mechanism, sustainable protection in coastal ecosystem and community from the impact of climate change. She coordinated convergent initiative project under four government agencies in Philippines, including Department of Agriculture, Department of Environment and Natural Resources, Department of Algarian Reform, Department of Interior and Local Government. And then the second speaker, I will ask uh, Deborah Su. She is the Executive Director of Research and Development uh, under the Ministry of Forestry in Fiji. So she is uh, a forest policy governance expert. She has a passionate working on conservation and nature. That's very good to uh, interact with her. So over the last uh, two decades that she has uh, uh, spent some time working in various Pacific Island countries, uh, including Australia and Germany. Uh, then uh, the third speaker uh, would be Marianne uh, Kaman from the FSC Senior Research Relations uh, Manager. Uh, she got background on European and tropical forest management from, I cannot pronounce the German name, so <laughs> University <laughs> Gattingen, I try. <laughs> okay, so she will bring uh, practical experience how the FSC involved and uh, uh, stimulate the uh, kind of enabling condition to allow local people to work on the timber trade. Then we get Paula uh, sorry, Gam Gamba, Gam Gumba. Yeah, she is the, she from Philippines, but work around the uh, uh, international organization like FAO, CIGAR, yeah, and uh, also uh, being involved in the International Society of Tropical Forester as part of the member and also the member of the uh, uh, for, uh, global network for forestry young professional. Yeah, so, but today she's gonna bring in the experience um, uh, from uh, her current work uh, talking about innovative finance from uh, Sorry, I have to switch the uh, uh, from uh, we retreat. Okay, that's good. I pronounce it correct. <laughs> correct me, I'm wrong. Okay, and then uh, the last but not least, probably I will get the uh, kind of perception among the young generation. Dude, I would call her uh, Anna Lee uh, Basto from uh, Argentina. Uh, she got background in biologies and uh, working. Uh, working at the moment for the doctoral degree on agriculture and uh, doc, uh, uh, agricultural science at the University of Buenos Aires, uh, Argentina. Probably we can hear different perspective from different practitioners in this room. And feel free to ask some questions if you like. Yeah, and interrupt uh, anytime if you'd like to learn more. We try to make it as interactive as possible. So with, without further ado, I'd like to start with uh, one uh, first of our speaker. To kick the ball rolling, I start with uh, Christine. You are talking about the experience that you work on the ground under the project called Karut Watershed Model Forest Management. Uh, and then probably you can share with us how you work with local people and what are the conditions that you are looking for? What are the gap and perhaps any uh, uh, challenges that we need to overcome altogether. Please, Christine, you might need to come here and then you have about 10 minutes to deal with us. Okay, thank you to so our uh, facilitator, moderator. So I am Christine, Maria Christine Sambrano. I am speaking here in behalf of the Karod Watershed Model Forest Management Council, Philippines, Bohol, specifically in Bohol. So actually, for the presentation, I think this one. So, 
Okay, for the picture, actually, Karood Watershed Model Forest Manage Model, uh, model Forest uh, composed of 25,704.75 hectares with 73 barangays. It is situated in the north, uh, southeast part of Bohol. So it covered 10 municipalities um, with 73 barangays. So for the entire 25,000 hectares, 67% uh, of it is belong to A and D, which is a, uh, alienable and disposable. 28% is timberland and 5% is military reserve. It's the classification. So the Karaod Watershed Model Forest is managed with the Karaod Watershed Model Forest Management Council. So its vision is ecologically balanced and sustainably managed by the committed stakeholders. Speaking of stakeholders, this Karaod Council is managed by multi-sectoral. So we have the 10 municipalities. Yeah. Ah, okay, okay. So um, the, the, this council is managed by the LGUs. That's what we call in our in the Philippines municipalities. Uh, 10 municipalities. We have an academ. We have the uh, support from, uh, we have the uh, agencies from the government. Okay. We have also the people's organization. So people's organization is group of the community. We have the upland people's organization. We have the lowland people's organization and we have the coastal lowland, uh, people's organization. Then we have the youth sectors. We have the indigenous people and we have private sector. So this council is uh, governed by a multi-sectoral. Multi so uh, this Karaod uh, Watershed Model Forest is also a member of the International Model Forest Network. So in which uh, the, uh, it is, this is the 52nd member in which uh, sorry, uh, composed of 66 countries in which the, this IMFN, International Model Forest Network, envision a world uh, where Asia's forests and surrounding landscapes are managed sustainably and where local people are able to make use of forest resources to better their lives on partnership with others. So it's the vision of the IMFN. So um, uh, these are the principles of this IMFN also. It focuses on partnership, landscape, commitment on sustainability, governance, programs and activities, knowledge sharing, capacity building and networking, and simply the principle also of the Karod Watershed Model Forest Management Council. So, okay. Next one. Okay. So, for the greatest strength of this council is the partnership. The partnership among the stakeholders, um, in which um, these stakeholders have the common goal to achieve uh, for uh, our uh, to achieve the common goal of the uh, multi-stakeholders. So also the commitment and sustainability. We ensure that commitment and, uh, and uh, sustainability in which for the commitment, uh, the local, the council itself has its own funding from the municipality. So we have a common funding uh, that uh, figure out uh, that slide show that the municipalities provide uh, annual funding for the uh, council for sustainability and as a sign also for their commitment. Also, the Herald Council also adopt the concept and scheme for the payment for environmental services. So giving emphasis on the collection of of the payment for the environmental services. So this shows that uh, the local people already are really involved in all activities. And we have implemented projects. We, uh, the 
for now we have because it is uh, a watershed approach so we have a rich tariff project for now we have the forest landscape restoration project from the fao involving the local people within living within the watershed with an objective of first sustainable management of the denuded area adapting the assisted natural regeneration the ANR approach and enhancement planting using agroforestry species depending on the grassroots needs of the people to strengthen ownership second is provide livelihood opportunities to the local people and increase the household income and third develop educate and mobilize constituents in supporting forest landscape resource mechanism strategies in restoration so it's it is the three objectives that we're trying to um met for the flr project implemented in carod watershed model forest and as i mentioned because we have a rich tariff uh, project so we also have project in the um brief so we have project also from the proposed project so from the ziz in which restoration also involved in the coastal ecosystem that the coastal ecosystems which are highly vulnerable to typhoons and worth safe guarding as well as the inhabitants are better protected against the impact of climate change as we all know that uh, for the last typhoon, typhoon Udet, uh, it is the southeast part of bohol that mostly heated from that typhoon so lastly um as i can say that um to access resources or financial in kind it is very important that a participatory planning involving the community to ensure commitment and sustainability for the restoration of our landscape thank you and good evening thanks a lot Christi uh, Christi uh, christine well, next, I'd like to bring in from the government perspective, especially the Ministry of Forestry from Fiji. So if you can share with us, yeah, well, I think I like to come, let's say like comparing the context because in Philippines, the land, some are part of the land still belong to the state and some part belong to their customer, uh, custom, uh, what do you call it, customary domain. But in Fiji, you see the, uh, the different because the land mostly uh, belong to the, to the community and see how we work together. So I think, yeah, Deb, you are ready to go? Please go ahead. Greetings all, Bula Vinaka. Thank you for giving me this opportunity and for Fiji especially to participate on this forum. So, about making it work in Fiji, enabling community forest management in Fiji. Well, first of all, I'd like to share where Fiji is in the first place. Quite often, we're not even on the map. We're very small. So Fiji is right on the edge. And zooming in a bit closer, um, we're very close to Tonga, where the volcano was recently. And also then our line of islands, um, so we're across from Australia and about directly above New Zealand. And then the Tongan volcano was about here. So this is the Tongan Trench and the Lao group of islands got a lot of the uh, tsunami as well as all, a lot of the ash. But I live here and I heard the rumbling from the, the eruption very clearly. So zooming into Fiji, we have uh, more than 300 islands, and these are the two main big islands, plus there are uh, about half a dozen smaller islands, but they're quite substantial as well. This is Taviuni. So the international date line, if it were straight, it, it would go right here. This is 180 degrees here. We've learned not to fly drones in that area. Um, so about our forests, we have five different forest types. Uh, naturally around the, the coastline and estuaries, we have our mangrove forest, so that's a light green. And then about 180, um, no, sorry, at 600 to 800 meters or so, there we have our upland rainforests. So our rainforests, of course, need rain and water, and so we receive our water 
through the southeast trade winds, through the rainy clouds that are pushed over, and they collect and they collect moisture as they go along. Sorry, I have to say it's quite difficult to present through the mask. So we have lowland rainforests um, below 600 meters, and there's still pockets of others, but that's more or less the, the guidelines. Above 800 meters, we have cloud forests, and the highest areas on this island of Itilevu, um, up to 1,324 meters, are cloud forests. On the leeward sides of the islands, um, so these are the lighter green sides. This is a satellite imagery. And on the lighter sides, there are dry forests. And on these islands as well, we have the dry forests. They're quite endangered. Um, it doesn't exist anymore on Viti Levu. Vanua Levu, maybe some small bits. And these are protected a little bit by the isolation as well as the steep slopes. So I just want to show you a bit about our governance a bit and how we get to where we are right now. So traditionally, it's been about native forest exploitation, where we have a right to log license that's issued, that was issued on an annual basis. We're trying to make that a bit longer now. But basically, our native forest does not have a forest manager. Now, all these native forests is communally owned because 90% 90, 90 of the land in Fiji is owned by the indigenous peoples, the Itaukei peoples. And they own most of the forest areas, like 97%. So from our national, national code of logging practice, um, which specifies you can log anything above 35 centimeters diameter at breast height. And that, you know, if you do that, there's not much forest left. A lot of conversion happens to other land uses then as well. We could get loads from the Fiji Development Bank for about 10 years. So that was mostly for log extraction. You know, you could get for um, trucks or portable sawmills or so chainsaws, but you couldn't get for nurseries and to establish forests because you couldn't possibly pay back your loan in 10 years. But an agriculture farmer could get anything and everything that they wanted from their houses to the fences, chickens, seeds, tools. So it was really a policy for government um, to convert forests to agriculture. And I'm not so shy to say this because it's happened everywhere in the world, which is I think why we have climate change now. So about 20 years ago, we started to get some good policies in. Um, for example, a rural land use policy that was endorsed by government cabinet in 2005, a Fiji forest policy, which introduced the concept of a permanent forest estate. And that's in 2007, but that's just the concept. We don't have it yet. We also have our Fiji forest certification standard and as well as, and that's not an implementation, um, but we also have our forest code of harvest practice with diameter limit table. So the diameter limit table is a harvesting regime that specifies the sizes um, as per species so that you maintain the forest composition and structure by the end of the harvesting regimes. And then you can come back, and this is only for native forests, you can come back in about 20 years to do another round of harvesting. Um, but that was really hard to actually implement because we're, that's what we're trying to do now, even though we've had it for more than 20 years, because um, industry is very strong. So red plus policy, we have something about that now. Um, there's something about protected areas, conservation, agroforestry. Agroforestry is usually between agriculture and forestry. It's fallen in between the cracks until now. And also, what about our rural land use plan? And to get to sustainability, indicators of that include having our permanent forest estate established and expanding on it because we've been losing our forests very quickly, would include having high conservation value forests in the permanent forest estate secured. Also happy communities because the landowners or the forest resource owners, they need to be happy with the activities that you're doing on it. And I have four minutes left, I'll go very quickly. We need happy forest workers. We need a vibrant trade in forest products and services to develop our forest-based bioeconomy. Progression from the red to the green has been a bit like this. Whenever there's a new project that comes, everyone gets really excited. And then 
it goes down and the new project comes up again. And sometimes you go backwards and we're going around in circles. And I think to get this gap, to bridge the gap, to get to sustainability, you need to have community forestry. They need to be organized. So the ministry is now starting to work on community development for which we would need a forest appreciation awareness program. We need to develop our forests um, permanently and to establish them and to also increase tree cover. So we need to develop a multiple use forest, a plantation forest, high conservation value forest and agroforestry for the development of non-timber forest products. And this can be done in urban forestry as well. Community development for safeguards for our permanent forest estate and all the ecosystem services that they bring um, that needs to be developed with the free prior informed consent with the feedback grievance redress mechanism, as well as needing to develop the business and financial literacy and value adding processes on that. So that means um, even designing basic designs of things, um, consistent supply, so teaching those business skills to communities. And even from one product, you can have different sizes in it and different colors and different shapes. So from one, you could get at least nine different products. Community networking is also vital between government agencies, conservation organizations, and civil society organizations, and getting things to the market and actually trading. So this looks a bit like, um, it's actually trying to show you the roots of a tree. And these big circles are like um, the nitrogen fixing nodules. And so I, I couldn't fit everything onto a, a, um, this shape of slide, a, a landscape orientation, so I had to squash them. So from the community development roots, we get community empowerment, where we have business, businesses um, and micro, small, medium forest enterprises for community livelihood, for community forest products. Um, and even using, we have this certification label, but that's not usually used in the forestry sector. But this is also to develop wealthy communities and strong and safe communities, green communities that are sustainable, also resilient and stable. And then also community forest certification. So I'm gonna leave this for Marianne to elaborate on. Thank you. Well, very good. Thanks a lot, Deb. Very, very, very precise in terms of the time allocation that we have. Very good to see and understand more about the forestry context in Fiji. So next one, as Deb mentions about referring to the, the certification, probably Marianne from the uh, Forest Stewardship Council could help us to understand more what are the mechanisms and tools that allow local people to work on and how to create the uh, institutional enabling condition and, and also the policies that Debbie, uh, uh, Deborah mentioned on. Please, Marianne, please. Good afternoon to all. Thanks a lot for the invitation, Bula. Um, hello, Susan. Um, well, we heard about the Philippines and about Fiji, and now I will tell you about the rest of the world, including Philippines and Fiji. Um, first of all, I'm jumping in here for my colleague, Pina Gervasi, who is a real restoration expert in FSC, and I'm more the generalist. I, I know all kinds of things, perhaps not so deep in detail, but I think I can share some thoughts about this topic. Pina is based in um, Peru. So she had problems with a visa to come and, and the time zone is not the best for her to participate now. Um, FSC is an international membership organization with members from the Philippines and from Fiji and from 90 other countries in the world or 110 perhaps. You will, I will help you to find the numbers. And um, FSC is, All oh, right, I, I tell you first what I want to tell you. I, I want to tell you where to find ecological restoration in FSC. And 
what we identified as uh, issues and barriers to restoration for communities and to share our lessons learned. And um, I want to tell you what we are doing and what we are planning to do to foster restoration efforts and also benefits for small and for community managed forests. FSC is um, known as a global platform where we bring multi-stakeholder groups and individuals together to identify the issues they see with forest management, sometimes issues, sometimes conflicts. And we, we help people, we facilitate their discussion so that they jointly develop solutions to address these challenges. And one of the solutions, and I think one of the most known solution and, and one of the oldest solutions of the, the FSC membership are the FSC standards and with the FSC forest management standards. We, and, and our members, we developed a way to help forest managers to show to the public and to communicate with the public that they are doing good responsible forest management. We have FSC certified area on 230 million hectare today. And this 230 million hectare are managed by 1,800 certified units, operations, forest management holdings, companies, big and small ones, in 82 countries, roughly. You can find the accurate number, the updated number on, on FSC certified forest on the website. And there you can also find reports about each of the certified units. So if you want to know details about the certified forest in your home country, <laughs> have a look there and, and dive into the details. Mm, with this 230 million hectare, we have roughly 60% of the production forest of the world under the FSC certificates. These are forests with management plans. There are much more forests which are not officially managed. And um, so from these FSC and PFC, the other big certification scheme, we, we jointly cover 8% or so of the global forest area. Um, Deborah mentioned that it's about FSC group certification in Fiji. And this means for, for my example, that's among the 1,820 certified operations, we have 6% um, or so group certificates. And if you um, count the, the people managing the forest in this future Fiji certified operation, then the number of individuals would, up, would add up in FSC certified terms to 150,000 forest managers under the FSC certification schemes. I tell you all these big pictures, these big numbers, um, because there is a very important criterion for this session. FSC has 10 principles for responsible forest management developed by the FSC members already in the year 1993. And there was a revision in 2012 by members. And now the 10 principles have, I think, 56 criteria. But I might miss it up with, with the old standard. It doesn't matter in the end. You, you can find out the details from your national forest management standards in, in simply having a look at the standard, what they say, how many criteria they have, if you want to know the exact number. But the important thing for me and here is principle six where the, um, it says the organization shall maintain the certified forest management operation, shall maintain, conserve, and or restore ecosystem services and environmental values of the MU's management unit, and shall avoid, repair, or mitigate negative environmental impacts of forest management interventions, of cutting trees, of building roads, of um whatever and um, even more interesting i think is one of the criteria criterion five for principle six 
which requires that the certified forest operations shall identify and protect representative sample areas of native ecosystems and or restore them to more natural conditions. With 10% of the certified area as minimum threshold for this certified area. This does not mean that each of the forest managers of the 1,500 has to have this 10% when they are in groups, they can, when, when they form a group, they can jointly agree on an area where they have this 10% set aside area. And this is, um, so it, it can be conservation area if there is, for example, old growth, but it can also be a restoration area. So we have these tools in FSC. And um, I think this is not an insignificant amount of restoration area under the FSC scheme, but it's difficult to find out exactly where the areas are only to the, at this point of time, we are revising the system so that we are more easily able to find out where this area are exactly. We, we can read 1,800 reports and can find out, out about it, but I can't give you now um, an easy answer. Um, over the time, FSC is almost 30 years old now. Over the time, we, we always try to develop solutions to make it easier for smallholders and for communities to, to apply and to get and to benefit from FSC certification. So what we see is that we have a steady growth in area and in number of small and community certificates, still each of them tropical or and small holdings. They, they cover only, you can, <laughs> the big thing is <laughs> under the, the black marks, there's six, uh, there's 7%. So only 7% of the total forest area is tropical and 7% is community or small. And, and there's of course an overlap, but they are of course also not tropical smallholders in FSC. The issues we identified um, over the time and, and roughly summarized here, um, territorial issues or ownership and, and tenure rights. We, we can't grant a certificate when it's not clear and not on paper who owns and who manages the land, who has a land use right. Otherwise, we don't know where the limits to, to illegal use of the forest resources are. A big challenge we identified for, for community forest management is a as a financial resources, they often depend on third party financial support and this support is often too short term. Um, certification is quite demanding. You don't simply get the certificate because you want to have it. Almost all forest management units with certificate had to do a lot of work to get the certificate. But this is how we, we build our reputation. Marketing expertise of the community members is, is often an issue. They, they might know they are indigenous trees and how to use them and how to do agroforestry, but they don't, often times they don't have the access to the markets and with the FSC certificate, I, they have easier access to markets, especially to international, but then they need the right volume. And, and well, we all know that restoration is not an, not such an easy task. It's not simply we, we throw a seed bomb and then we have a forest. It's, it's about the right tree in the right place at the right time for the right use. So we hope with FSC that we can share, that we enable sharing of expertise in this area. There was an interesting WWF study about the economic as uh, a profitability of um, responsible forest management. And they found that in, in FSC that uh, financial benefits tend to outweigh the costs, but it, it depends very much on the company. But the, the interesting thing is that the business case, the positive benefit was stronger, higher for tropical forest operations and for small and medium producers compared to the, the bigger companies. But this only comes after six years. In, in average. And usually funding for these communities for certification is shorter term and the certificate lasts five years and then it must be renewed. 
So longer term, in financial support would be important. Now, let me quickly run to the main points. What are we doing? We, um, we have a, we consolidated all our many tries over many years with group certification, with community certificates, with special labels for community origin under the Community and Family Forest Program. And this program is working together with other programs in FSC. For example, the Ecosystem Services Procedure, which, which helps certified operations as an add-on to bring, to, to show verified impact of good forest management on ecosystem services. Um, and this is um, a support tool or lessons learned from this ecosystem services and, and links to payment for ecosystem services are currently used in our work to develop a restoration toolbox. There's NEPCON, many of you will know it in this area, the NEPCON organization, they have a new name, sorry. But NEPCON is working on the forest ecosystem restoration field verification standard, and we, we are trying to learn from them and help them. And um, with this tool, we, we hope to be able to, to come up later on, not, not before 26, with this restoration toolbox, which can help um, to have a strategic and a, a global approach to, to bring evidence for ecosystem services uh, and for restoration, first of all, for restoration benefits and the difference to mainstream management. And we have a number of um, other programs where we learn with our membership on um, intact forest landscape management on um, we FSC decided 30 years ago that we do not certify companies who converted natural forest to plantation. And now we have a new generation of forest owners on, and managers on these areas. So we, we try to trigger incentives to go for restoration and with the idea that they can later on when, when they did good rest restoration efforts that they can then apply for FSC certification even though the parent generation did the conversion. And from all these projects we, we can learn in FSC with the members how to come up with, with a good restoration framework and standard. And I think this is a the message of shared learning and of mm -hmm. even, for example, also in the Indigenous Foundation, which is founded and, and managed by Indigenous leaders to advise the board of directors of FSC on these issues. I think we can learn as organization and together with our members and with, with our many partners. And that's what I wanted to share. I can talk five minutes longer. I don't do it now. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot, Marianne. Yeah, you touched on the uh, resources and certification and how to help the uh, local people and also be sure the uh, restoration become uh, kind of uh, acceptable and more become, uh, become effective. You also touched on the, uh, the resources that required uh, to get the certification. Uh, finance could be part of the resources that we are thinking, not only getting the certification, but build upon it, build the capacities of the local people. Well, I'm sure Paula will help us to understand more what uh, we are three is doing, uh, talking about innovative finance, probably Paula, would you like to share with us more? Hi everyone. Hi everyone here uh, in person and also here uh, online. So I'm just gonna remove my tech hat in a minute and then now wear a presenter hat. So um, aside from handling the Zoom here, um, I'll be presenting about our work at Veritry and some of my personal reflections along the way of my career doing forest uh, landscape restoration. Um, so verified, I have to share it first uh, in the Zoom. Uh, 
Yes, we're not going to leave you out, all those who are joining virtually. Um, we're sharing you the fun here at Seoul. So first, I'm going to share the, the, uh, what, what we do at um, Veritree. So we do a verified global restoration um, and also working with businesses and corporates to make the future uh, restorative. So I am their program lead uh, for nature-based solutions. And um, um, just a disclaimer, I just started this work uh, two months ago. So I'm just two months old in this company. But I have, as, as Ron mentioned earlier, I have worked with uh, um, uh, FAO and CGIAR before and also IUFRO uh, when I was uh, a bit younger. Um, so going back to Veritree, how did it all start? So uh, the journey of Veritree started in 2008. And the, the, our co-founders, our founders um, started planting trees in their um, hometown and, uh, you know, to, to tap into the carbon, carbon world. <laughs> and after, after a few years, they, they, they realized that, you know, that this has to be more sustainable and, you know, that there should be more um, engagement with consumers and other and, and with, with um, um, planters, um, other planters around the world to make it to, to upscale what we're doing, what they're doing. And so they cre created Tentry, which actually I'm wearing right now, this black uh, 1C. So Tentry is a clothing brand based in Vancouver. Um, so basically it has a very simple model. You buy one item with us, we plant 10 trees. Um, that's why it's Tentry. Um, so with the goal of building a restorative business model that served to vehicle to do to, to tree planting. Um, in 2019, you know, after after doing this tree planting around the world, we did plant. They did the planting in Madagascar, Indonesia, Canada, um, uh, and um, uh, there's another site which I am forgetting right now, but I hope it comes later. But uh, after all the uh, millions of trees planted, there's a um, a reflection that this has to be uh, validated. This has to be verified, and to to have that um, transparent and accountability, transparency and accountability in the tree planting world, and to to show that they're really claiming they created very that that they're really planting, they they created very tree to solve this challenge. So, as of today, um, there are seventy five million trees planted. Um, through uh, Tentree, through the products that we've sold in Tentree. And then we have a mission that by 2030, we will pl plant 1 billion trees, which is powered by very tree, which is verified uh, trees, actual trees planted on the ground. But how do we do actually in very tree? Uh, so actually, what is the, what is the uh, impetus behind this? And as I've, as I've actually um, kind of touched upon about this earlier, that a lot of businesses, there's a, a big movement right now on, on say Samsung, Jeep, wanting to plant trees. A lot of corporates, they, they, wanna, they want, they have this desire to take part on the, on the restoration uh, space. But the thing is that um, one tree could be claimed by many uh, um, sponsors. There's double counting. And it could also, tree planting could also be a tool for greenwashing. And so for us, we want to have, you know, genuine change on the ground. So we are creating this uh, uh, authentic restorative initiatives that also targets consumers. So we will link consumers, planters, and corporates, those three stakeholders, because we see that, you know, when businesses are, are a part of this and then when they, when trust and it's transparent, they could be a, a huge part of our of the of, of the movement that we're creating in forest restoration. So they we we realize that ESG investments true tr tr value. You know, there's a lot of um, ESG efforts in corporates, and so how, how do we actually align them to to genuine um, forest restoration initiatives? You know, to increase in confidence and transparency to to the investments. Um, stakeholder loyalty. I'll, I'll tap. I'll discuss more of this in in my personal reflections. The that we are um, creating um, um, trust in in all of the stakeholders that we are um, linking, and also very little marketable content. Um, there's a lot of potential we are talking about in uh, um, um, forest restoration, but how do we actually make it? Uh, 
uh, linked to the markets. And we're gonna, I'm going to talk more about that, how we are, we're tapping into consumers. And so Veritree is a data-driven restorative platform that connects nature-based solution with mission-driven companies. So we're actually acting as a bridge you know, with corporates and local planting organizations on the ground. And we use on-the-ground verification and blockchain verification um, to improve this transparency. So we, we are, we are um, really tracking actual trees planted on the ground and at the same time working closely with communities on doing this. Um, we scale consumer centric programs between planting organizations and corporations around the world. And our mission, again, is to plant 1 billion trees within the decade. And so the tech work is that we monitor, verify, and approve tree planting sessions through our uh, uh, engagement with planting partners. And verified uh, planting sessions have. We, we tokenize these trees and upload this to the verify system to store it in the blockchain and use this blockchain to mitigate the risk of double counting, as I mentioned earlier. And to use these solutions, you know, to seamlessly incorporate tree planting into their product. So I, as I was talking to our current partners, that there's a lot of um, 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 systems right now that are we're using. So how do we harmonize these systems? And make it more um, easy for people to, to work, you know, to work with us in terms of achieving the, the, the goals that we're doing. And so, as I mentioned earlier, how do we, how do we do this? So for companies, there's company forests and that would detail what they're doing, what's, what, what are their targets, what have they accomplished already. And for the partner portal, we have this is for the local planting organizations to see to, so they could report what how many trees are planted already um and also for the for the consumers so for the buyers of for example in tentry how do they actually see this uh their efforts in terms of uh, of uh, of their efforts in terms of uh, buying say for example in tentry's case buying a t-shirt how many trees have they actually planted with that there's more to the tech. I'm not the tech, uh, the tech person in our company. I'm a forester by profession. So if you are interested in the tech, the blockchain, I'm not the person for that. Um, um, I, I could connect you if you are interested with that. I could connect you with a, with a, um, with a team that works on, on the tech side. But for me, uh, right now, I'm going to talk to you uh, about planting organization. So what does this tech mean for the planting organization? Because part of my job at a very tree is that um, I look for planting organizations around the world who could plant trees, you know, like, for example, corporate, a corporate A wants to plant 1 million trees in this year. So for me, it's like, who would be the best partner for this, you know, so for a planting organization, they use um, the app, we have an app to when they plant, and they use the app, so they plant, they verify, and they, they track it, and then they engage it with the, with the corporate sponsor that, um, that uh, supported their, their work. So these, uh, this technology is basically letting them um, report or letting them uh, showcase what they have done for, for, um, for, for the forest. Um, so for me, as I mentioned earlier, I have uh, I am only two months old in in, in the company, but I, I'm incorporating my insights on on developing or or being part of a forest landscape restoration uh, projects with my previous organizations and you know with my research work before in the Philippines and work, working with um, Christine in Bohol on assisted natural regeneration. What are what are what do I think are the barriers? Because I think this says, this part of the session wants to know about the barriers uh, for community restoration. First, I'm talking about tech innovation, earth financing, but in the end, um, these are these are crucial part to scale up FLR. But also, we should not lose focus on the fundamental uh, issues that we're facing, like tenure, the capacity of local communities. I, I was speaking with a with a local partner last week, but you know, how do they develop business model and agroforestry livelihood that we're proposing? They're, they're not equipped for that, you know, just, just an example. So they, we, we should not lose focus on the fundamental issues that FLR is facing, you know, the, the rights of people. Um, I think Marion mentioned earlier about this, so you know, that 
that territorial um, rights is, is also an important factor. Marion or um, Deborah? Yes, Marion. Yeah. Um, and also, we should go beyond carbon. I was just reading a paper the other day that people plant trees not because of carbon, not because of biodiversity, but because of the utility of trees that, that it gives. So, you know, we, we would engage more people if we provide local, genuine local incentives, you know, not just promise of carbon, not just a promise of something. So if we tap into to the real needs of the local people, if we engage with them and know about their needs, and I think that's that would make a successful um, FLR project. Um, three, this is a very interesting, because this, this is my first private sector job. And there's a difference in language. I came from FAO, I came from the academe. We talk about restoring millions of hectares. And then when it came to private sector, corporate A wants to plant mi million of trees. So I was like, okay. So there's like difference of language in, in different um, sectors. So how could we harmonize that? It's a, it's a challenge. And trust, I believe trust is really important in at all levels. And I think that's what we're trying to build here uh, in very tree, you know, it's between uh, corporates, you know, trust that that with the partnership that they're we're building with them, we could deliver that trust with planters or the local communities on the ground. I think that's also very important to build on because for me, my experience is that you can just come in with say thousands of dollars and say, oh, plant this number of trees. It's not that easy you know it's not just all about money that's my personal reflection you know you can't just like okay we have money from corporate a let's plant here and there and it's like no it's not you have to build trust and the power of communication and storytelling i feel like if we want to build you know if we really put, want to push flr forward we have to tap into this i commend rico for doing this you do a great job on communication and storytelling but we really have to scale up how do we engage with consumers with people on terms of communicating um forest restoration and also you know going beyond tree planting that there are many many other approaches on forest restoration and i think that's it if you have any other questions for example, on tech or blockchain <laughs> that I can't respond right now, please send me an email. Here's my email address. Thank you. And um, yeah, Ron. Yeah, very nice to hear the innovation. Yeah, thinking out of the box, thinking about how to use technologies, uh, not in terms of tapping the uh, resources available out there on under the corporate service, under the corporate sector, and also even improving the trust and governance being more transparency yeah, and how to work together with, uh, with those people. So, well, I'd like to go for the last speakers, not the least one. Uh, Annalie, if you would like to share with us your perspective in terms of after you listen to this, yeah, I think we set the context on the watershed area, working on the policies from Fiji and uh, uh, situation in, in Fiji. Then Marion share with us on the Forest Steward, uh, Stewardship Council, and then Paula bring in a different perspective, uh, more on the uh, innovative and finance. So, Annalie, would you like to share with us how you see things should be moving ahead? Yeah, First of all, thank you very much for having in mind but for this uh, session. My name is Anali Bustos. I'm from Argentina. I'm a scientist. I'm working on ecosystem restoration on the, um, in the scientific field, but I'm also a, a restoration practitioner. So what I will present today for you is a, a project in which I've been working since uh, 2016. The name of this project is the Montelegre Nature Reserve. And to start, I will, I'm showing this picture for my perspective is shocking. This is a province, is the province in which I was born in the central area of Argentina. Um, as you can see, in less than a century, we 
lost uh, at least, uh, or, or the, 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 um, the number is the 95% of the forest, the cover forest of the province. Um, all that remain at today are small uh, patches of forest that are located mainly on the part of the mountains of my province. And the situation is this way because uh, Cordoba has a very fertile and flat land. So this is a perfect situation for the agricultural practices. And the, the agriculture uh, has been the main pressure uh, under the forest. So the question is, what, what, what can we do to fix this? So after my um, finishing my bachelor in biological science, I was invited to be part of a, um, a starting uh, an initial project in a farm of a family in Cordoba. They, has, uh, they have a, a, a farm with traditional uh, agricultural practices, but into the, this, this uh, property, they have 100 hectares of forest. So they asking me, asked me, what can we do with this? Uh, what we have here? So the starting point in 2016 was, okay, let's diagnostic this and let's see what we can do. So the situation is, is in this forest is that the native part of the, of the forest is degraded because of the agriculture in, at the first, um, in, in, in first uh, place. But there are many, many, many uh, uh, cover uh, forests of exotic plant species. So the native trees are uh, completely damaged and the ecosystem that is, is called uh, espinal is, uh, is in a point that is very, very difficult to restore. And this is one of the, uh, I think the last uh, patch of forest of espinal in Cordoba and in the world because it's a really particular uh, ecosystem. So the first uh, steps, uh, were, um, well, were start to work with the family. We were just five people working on the control of the exotic plant species. And the funding for to do this was from the, the land, land owners, from the family. So that's something hard to, to, to uh, resolve because when they have another problems in their lives or in their economies, the first thing they stop to do is the restoration of the forest. But they continue do, doing this uh, through the time. Uh, maybe uh, on 2017 and 2018, they were working low. So uh, the steps were trying to di displace the exotic plant species and then uh, restore the areas with native plant species like these little seedlings, seedlings you're uh, seeing there. And this is how the project started. And the things were, were doing, were well uh, resolved. And at today, this is uh, the, the status of the project. Um, on, on 2020, we have the lucky of uh, one uh, found from the GLF, the Global Landscape Forum, to work on ecosystem restoration. The program is called a Restoration Stewards Program and is for uh, young people who is working on ecosystem restoration and I won as the Forest Restoration Steward. So that's, that was amazing for us because we could uh, booster the project in many aspects. And one of them was to engage the community. If we think about the, this area that is almost all is agricultural, uh, an agricultural landscape, uh, one fact is that people uh, has lost the cultural, the cultural identity with the forest. They think that the natural uh, ecosystem is agriculture. So when we started to, to think about this as a project or as a nature reserve, we thought 
okay, we can invite people to work here, but we had doubts about how much people would um, be interested to work in forest restoration in an area in which uh, all the, the landscape is agricultural. So uh, we have, uh, we, we were successful uh, in, in communication and well, we created three uh, volunteer days for the people, uh, for the local communities around this, this place. And uh, those are one of the photos on those, those days. And it was amazing the, the engagement and the interesting of on the interest of the people to participate. So I didn't put the numbers of the project here, but uh, today we have planted we planted uh, at the, um, near to two thousand seedlings, and seventy uh, people participated in in the different uh, volunteer activities. So. This show us that it's possible to restore forests in agricultural landscapes. And I think this, that this project could be as, as, as an example for other landowners in the region to, to follow the steps of Monte Alegre. Uh, the restoration of forests in uh, agricultural landscapes is very, very challenging, but I think we need to create new things and we need to be um, uh, to have the, the, the courage to do it. So the, these are all other parts of the project besides the ecological restoration and the social restoration. Uh, we have a school project to invite uh, children to participate in the different activities in the forest. We have a company pro company's project to articulate with the in the finance part of the project, which is the, for long the most uh, dif difficult uh, uh, part to resolve, and also something that for me is amazing and uh, is if not the, the best part is that the family, the the landowners, are transitioning through agroecological practices, and they. Uh, have been uh, agriculture uh, farmers from many many years in a uh, traditional agriculture so this is uh, a proof that the the forest restoration can uh, generate another consequences not related exactly with forest but also with the sustainability of the of the land and so the the um, production it can can be can be hand by hand with with the restoration. So, this is the forest, the Espinal Forest, just to you know it. And my final final conclusion is that we we need to reframe our understanding on the deforestation because deforestation is not a problem. I think deforestation is a consequence is a symptom of the economic, economic system we have. So if we start of this point and we change and reframe the concepts, I think I, I completely, I'm completely sure that this is possible. We really can restore many, many hectares of forest and to achieve the objectives that we have at the national and international level. So this is, the grand um, son of the, the um, landowners who is planting uh, her seedling. So this is an example. And for me, the perspective is that this, this little project will inspire many people uh, around the, the, uh, the area of influence of the project. And the proof of, the, of this uh, is that um, I'm been contacting for another landowners uh, near the, this place uh, into Cordoba in, in the same province, and they are asking me for uh, technical assistance uh, because they don't know how to restore the forest and they don't have the uh, financial capacity to do it. So I think we need to fill this gap. And well, I have many ideas and I'm trying to create a, a framework and a framework and a big picture 
to, to start a big project to assist uh, them and to help them to restore many of he hectares of forest in Cordoba. So that's it. Thank you very much for this space. Thank you very much, uh, Anneli. Yeah, to bring in a different perspective, talking about how to get people uh, involved in restoration. I like the idea of redefining the term uh, deforestation because it's part of the land use. A lot of people talking about the negative uh, about the uh, deforestation, but in fact, it could be part of the land use. Very good, thanks a lot. Well, I just wonder, well, I keep uh, asking speaker to speak in a row, and I just wonder if there is any question from the chat or uh, let's start from the chat. Uh, Sheila, would you like to uh, help me? We have a few comments and questions. The first one from Menachi is how do you monitor the trees planted? How is monitoring done? I don't know exactly. We started that in the beginning. Is that where you're finishing? Okay. Okay. Let's take one by one because we are working through online. <laughs> Well, thanks for the question. Um, there are different monitoring metrics um, for, for very trees case, you know, we have different monitoring metrics um, that we follow. And also we, there are also, this is also depending on the site, like there's also going beyond how trees surviving or growing. There are also other metrics if you want to have a more holistic approach to restoration, like biodiversity, food and nutrition. Um, there are if if, uh, if if just more on the, is it tree? That's what we're saying, tree? The question. The, the question is, how, how do you monitor if trees are planted? Ah, yeah. It's more of a, a on the planters. Uh, um, so using the app, using the app uh, done by Veritree. So they, they provide those um, uh, certain uh, information that, that is needed to, to submit that on, on the blockchain. And that um, that is uh, you know we we harmonize that with other planters and that we have those details that would prove um, in terms of the location in terms of the um, the species and all the other information that was um, that 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 the trees are actually planted. There we we have our our own app for that. Sure. Um, I have the my email on the presentation. If you have, if you want more information about the the app that uh, we are, we have developed ourselves. Okay. Thanks, Light Polar. I'm sure it's not only responding to questions to, uh, uh, I think from the chat, but I'm sure it would be useful for many uh, of us to uh, learn more about the application, how to monitor. How the tree planted and where it planted and how it grows and how it become a uh, forest. Uh, uh, you, Sheila, you mentioned about the second question. The second thing comes a comment from Patrick Durst. Um, he would like to just comment on the importance of the remedial technology in Latin. Okay, thanks a lot, Pat. Uh, I wish I could see you here. Uh, I heard that you are here, but uh, well, hope, hope to catch up later. Yeah, interesting and then uh, important of the enabling policy environment. I think we have heard from uh, the case of Philippines. Uh, Christine also mentions about the policy commitment, the government commitment, and also from uh, uh, Deb, Deborah and also from Marion. Uh, anyone like to respond to this question talking about the uh, enabling policy environment? Yeah, so it's a big bottleneck. And Marion, you mentioned about the tenures. Yeah, it's a big bottleneck. It's a foundation of how to move ahead. Anyone like to respond? Uh, Christine, you'd like to respond on Pat uh, question on the policy? The, uh, the favorable policy or oh, anyone? Okay, Marianne, you'd like to? Yeah, what, what we see in-, in so, uh, You have to come to, <laughs> that is the challenge of having- So the enabling or supporting um, 
environment is super important. I think certification works much better when when the policy background is is in support. And I think that that goes for all of our activities. If if the local government, if the local people, if the um, administration is not in support when there's corruption, when there's illegal trade, whatever, then restoration has um, will, will be more challenging than it is anyway. So Patrick's point is a really important one. Okay. Uh, Deborah here, and I can also add that is crucial. That's what we don't have in Fiji right now, and that is what we need. That supporting enabling environment, the policy for that, and the legislation as well. It's sort of there, but it has to be right on the point. Thank you. Right, and also Pat, uh, Christine, like to uh, respond to your comments yeah. too. Hi, Pat. I hope I can meet you here. <laughs> Actually, for Carol, for the Philippines, for the policy, it is incorporated in the in the policy in the municipality because the municipality has its what we call the FLUP, the Forest Landscape. Uh, uh, land use. So um, it is it is already uh, categorized. It is already from in the municipality level, where is the uh, the far uh, the foreign uh, the land use the forest land use the um, uh, agricultural land use and for the residential. So. Uh, the policy already uh, in place in the LG level. Oh. All right, thanks a lot, uh, Christine. Yeah, I'm sure the, uh, the 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 policy, the enabling policy environment is quite crucial. It's not only about having the enabling policies in place, but uh, about how these policy can coordinate among themselves. And I think one of the uh, comment from probably uh, from Deborah talking about the uh, intervention, how we can coordinate among all of this and then put that uh, the policy in practice. Uh, I just wonder, is there any other comment question from the chat? If not, is there anyone from the room would like to place any question to specific speaker? We still have some time. David, okay, you have to come here. Um, I, I really enjoyed the presentation. I have a specific question for Paola, if that's okay. And it, it but it touches on all of your presentations. Is the, is the community aspect, the participation aspect, and it's how you can connect the technology and make sure the communities can use that and are empowered by that, and their rights are also respected. And it would be great if you could share a little bit because I find the very tree fascinating. I really do. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's actually. Oh, sorry. <laughs> It's actually what I'm, um, you know, my task, uh, you know, that's that's my one of my part of my TOR in in Veritri, you know, to make sure that, you know, we have certain standards that we are developing. We're still a nascent um, or uh, uh, corp uh, company, so we're still on the building blocks on this. But we, for me, I, personally, I want to make sure that we're all following certain standards, codes of ethics in terms of working with community, and that is. You know, making sure that rights are are you know are not railroaded, and also that we are supporting um we're su we're supporting them financially, but not because you know we just want a, an instant uh, restoration project that would sprung up. You know that we really want to capacitate them in terms of uh, developing agroforestry, for example, or develop developing a more um, sustainable forest restoration efforts. There's another part that you said rights and also working with community. Yes, and empowerment, you know, like, like this is not just, um, not just about fueling monies to fueling, you know, funneling, sorry, funneling monies to community, but we make sure that the, they are capacitated to, to take on this role and also to that, you know, if, of course, we, we're, we're, our, our pot is not bottomless, our pots are not bottomless, we also make sure that other sectors of forestry are into this, that you know, for me, I, I make sure that all the all my networks that I could tap in that could that could provide support to communities would would be explored. For example, you know, finding finding scientists from C4 who could help us develop a business plan on this and this um, agroforestry, for example. You know, some so this is not 
this is beyond also working with local communities, but also working with partners within the forestry sector. I hope that's clear. Thank you. Right, that opened the gate for uh, any partners to, uh, to work with VR3, uh, I assume, including Recov. Yeah, we are intriguing in terms of learning more a new thing. Well, I think uh, if we don't have the question from the floor, I'd like to throw some uh, a few questions to the speaker. When we talk about forest uh, restoration, I assume that it's not only about planting trees. Yeah, there are many ways to get the uh, uh, forest ecosystem back. But in terms of working with the local communities, probably they cannot eat tree. Yeah, they have to survive. So how can we uh, bring that up and see the uh, incentive for the local people to engage with us? They cannot wait for long in terms of getting the timber and sell the timber, or at the same time, they cannot eat the timber. So they have to rely on the uh, uh, basic needs that they have to respond to their family. So how, how, what would be, what would be the kind of a incentive for the local to, to work with, with us? Yeah, anyone like to, to, to comment on that? Yeah, Christine, please. Yes, yes, okay. Actually, uh, in the restoration process what, uh, that we implemented in Carrot Watershed, what we did is that uh, we consult first with the bottom line of the uh, challenge which is the denuded area. Now we, we know that uh, there are community living there. So we try to assess what are, their, what are their kinds of living, their livelihood. So by that, um, because we know that restora restoration process is not only planting, but um, also addressing the needs of the local people. So uh, we designed the restoration process that we adopt the ANR process, the ANR, the Assisted Natural Regeneration. Then along that, because the bottom line of the, uh, the new, denuded part is the forest fire. We have the forest fire. Uh, it is the bottom line, and which is the bottom line of that forest fire is the information gap among the community. Because there are community uh, down uh, in, uh, who are do farming on agriculture. So, we try to incorporate the agriculture into forestry. We try to uh, build a fire break to break the fire in cases then. In the fire break, um, because we have a commitment direct to the household level, to the household level who are uh, tilling the land, tilling the area, uh, cultivating the area. So uh, we try to motivate them to plant cash crops on the uh, fire break because as we observe because actually this is the second time that we had project with the FLR with the FAO so we had um, um, observed really that uh, if the land is uh, will be cultivated will be planted uh, regenerance will grow where is it grow because uh, of course uh, the land uh, already there is planted at the same time um, the local people will be earning from the cash crops that they planted. So we have an agreement with them that uh, if regenerants will come, uh, we, we will growing up, then uh, they will uh, leave it as it. Uh, we try to uh, look for species. We try to look for um, kind of um, uh, agricultural um, cash crops that is suitable in their choice, not in our choice, because uh, if it is in their choice, of course, uh, commitment uh, will be there because they know that will, they will be earning. Uh, in, within the ANR site, so uh, we try to plant the agroforestry product and uh, with the condition that uh, it's them, it's the family who will be going to harvest the the, the fruits or the, uh, the product that uh, we'll be uh, giving from that area, from the forestry, uh, depending also on their choice. So that is why in my last, uh, as you heard at my last uh, 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 speech uh, before that, uh, we have to involve the local people in, uh, in the planning because it is really very critical that uh, they should know how to do it, they should be uh, part of the planning for their commitment and support. 
So that's how we did in uh, the restoration process in our area in the implementation of the uh, uh, forest uh, uh, FLR, forest landscape restoration, because in the restoration process, as I said, uh, it is not planting, but also giving livelihood to the people. Because if these uh, people, if this of the community will be involved in the restoration, then success eh, is very attainable. And we try also to engage not uh, to the uh, to a household which is a member of a uh, strong organization, the people's organization. So that's the criteria that we try to build that for sustainability also because they are belong to a group. Okay, so in the FLR process also, um, because we have uh, projects also from the government, we try also to uh, uh, give them assist assistance based on the attributions, because we have uh, projects from the Department of Environmental and Natural Resources, we have projects from the Department of Agriculture, we try also um, to give assistance to them um, based on the attributions of the agencies. So. What we try to emphasize is that uh, uh, we really support the livelihood of the people or livelihood opportunities of the people so that they will be our partner mm -hmm. for the restoration process. Right. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Christine. Uh, I think we have one question from the chat. What challenges have you Right. What challenges did you face while convincing communities? Any anyone jumping to this comment? Okay, please do. So the Fijian communities, um, the challenge is the need for cash, especially after big cyclones, category five cyclones after 2016, uh, the price of the most valuable crop, uh, which is not even to eat, mind you, it's kava. And so that makes a drink that's um, very relaxing. And it also has very wide demand and high demand for pharmaceutical use. Um, so the price of that went up four times from $15 US uh, a kilo to now um, times for that. <laughs> and so yeah, the market demand is huge. And so it's shifting agriculture for them. Um, this crop is, it's a pepper plant and it's planted in native forest. That's about 50% shade first off, but it's after five years, it's 100% deforestation on that. And then with COVID, this COVID situation, it's made it even worse because we don't have land use planning that we should have. And we don't have the engagement for community forest management that we should have. So forestry is giving away to all the other pressures. And so with COVID-19, the people that have been laid off from the tourism industry um, and other people that live in town that may not have jobs anymore. So they turn to cultivating kava. And this last year, these last few months, the price of ginger has also gone up a lot. So it's, it's a hard fight. Right. And also with the management um, and the governance, even people in the Ministry of Forestry, my own ministry, don't appreciate all the other things as well. And they don't know how to break through the barriers. So they take a lot of things for granted. Right. Thanks a lot, uh, Deb. Yeah, it's not only about, in uh, well, bringing the communities to understand the benefit that we we'll get from the forest restoration, but also the policy makers yeah, who try to convert the forest area into other types of land use for the economic purposes. Okay. Uh, good. Do we have any comment? Okay. If not, I'd like to throw another, uh, uh, another, another question. Well, I think now today, a uh, number of private companies like Paula, you mentioned about the corporate uh, people and, and, and those who it investor. They like to invest in forest restoration. And how can we ensure that the local people will gain enough benefit? I think even in Glasgow or in COP26, this issue was brought up yeah, in the discussion quite uh, massively. 
how can we ensure the benefit uh, of this uh, investor, investment, corporate service, big money will go to, to benefit the local people and incentivize them to join in the restoration. Any answer? Anyone like to jump to this question? Yeah, Marianne, please. Mm -hmm. And perhaps Paula. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that it's overly constructive, but first of all, I would say that there is no guarantee. We can't guarantee. But what can, can contribute to success, I think, is, is um, good communication. And, and Paula mentioned it, there are different languages. Mm -hmm. And if people who do actively engage in restoration are able to show that the restoration efforts end in, in forests and not in another degraded area in, or in failed planting or so, or in large scale monoculture, mm -hmm. then I think there's a, a better chance for them to be heard and to get longer term support. But mm -hmm. guarantee, I would not use this word. Dangerous. Yeah, that's a good point, Marian. Also, I think that we should face the reality that it's a long work, you know, like it's not an overnight thing that we're doing here. You know, trees take a minimum of seven years, for example, for, for it to be to, to stabilize itself. But so it's the same thing for us that we have to accept that it's sometimes capacities of communities varies too. There are communities that are well advanced, but there are communities too that you have to hold their hands through this, you know, put money on, on capacity building, put money years and years, but we, we, don't, we don't have a simple solution, but it's more of being adaptive and being true to the reality that this takes time. Okay, good, thanks a lot, uh, Paula and uh, Marianne. Okay, I just want to check, is there anyone Comment, no comment, okay. I just want to double check any question from the floor here. If not, I'm gonna move to the, uh, to the last part of the, uh, of the discussion perhaps. Yeah, probably I may ask all the speakers to share. If we like to see uh, the, uh, what would be the highest priorities that we should move together? I know that you come from different roles different responsibilities and also different contexts. Yeah, talking about Philippines, Fiji, Argentina, and also Marianne, you have uh, a lot of uh, experiences. Oh, in Polar from the global. So what would be your highest priorities that we should work together to create the enabling condition to ensure the success of the community-based forest restoration will be in, let's say like soon. Yeah, I know that it will take some time, but uh, if we like to see things, we have to start now. So what would be the highest priorities that we should do together? Anyone like to jump first? Yeah, Marianne, please. Yeah, I think I have again a more philosophical answer to it. I would say the highest priority is really in, in really working together and listening to each other and in partnering with each other and not in competing with each other. That's, that would be my priority. Thanks a lot, <laughs> thanks a lot. Anyone else? Anyone else like to jump into this comment? I think, uh, okay, we also in, uh, I think also the, the most priority is really to strengthen the IEC, the information down to the, yeah. down to the ground because if the people, if the community really understand what's the benefit of the restoration, then I think uh, half of our job was already done. So we have to strengthen the IEC down to the, uh, the ground level. All right. Good. Okay. Uh, uh, Deb or Apollo or uh... Anali, would you like to share the final word? Uh, just really quick, yes, that cooperation is very important to develop together because not everybody is, is where they should be. 
but we can help each other to get there, I think. Thank all you. Right. Right. Just strengthening the points of all the previous speakers, you know, co collaboration at all levels. And I think that's what also we're doing at Very Tree, you know, finding that corporate, aligning those cor corporate pledges to real plant, to real trees planted on the ground. Um, I think that's um, just to amplify that call. All right. Uh, I'd like to say thank you very much to uh, all speakers. It's enlightening me uh, thinking about how we like to move ahead. We cover the common goals among the multi-stakeholders. We talk a lot about the commitment, financial commitment, technical commitment from all the local authorities, partners, agencies. We talk about resources, how to bring in, uh, how to implement, and how to ensure the local people get benefit. Uh, we talk about enabling policies uh, that Pat mentioned. Yeah, so I'm glad that in the case of watershed, yeah, you bring in a different department together. Otherwise, they are competing and even sometimes creating conflict on the policies how to implement. And also, we talk about the mechanisms how to bring these stakeholders together and how to make it work. Otherwise, we are thinking only uh, the parallel project yeah, never meet to each other. And also we're talking about a different mechanism from the uh, certification example from the FFC, talking about innovation and technologies to support, how to tap in uh, financial resources and improving trust, yeah, and create the uh, incentive for their uh, people. I'm glad that uh, speakers do not mention about the carbon. Yeah, so I think it's, it's yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I have to say that because it's, uh, it's work among the uh, experts like us, but it may not work for the local people. Yeah. And thinking about how to uh, uh, directly work with the uh, communities and how can we build their capacities to work with. Thanks a lot for all these uh, exciting uh, experience that you share with us. I'd like to say thank you, Christine, uh, uh, Annie, Annie, Annie. Anali, uh, Deb, and uh, Marianne. And thanks for the uh, ISTF, uh, International uh, Society on the Tropical Forester to join with Breakoff to run this site, set, uh, site event session. I know that it's a little bit late of the day, but I'm sure we have learned quite a lot and see how we work together. Thanks all the audience who join in this room and also uh, virtually. I wish you all the best and uh, well, I hope that you have learned good, uh, good things from this discussion. I'd like to say thank you very much to all and wish you all the best uh, at where you are. Thank you very much. Thank you. Two questions. Which?